so hello everyone. Thanks for uh, joining the first Q webinar organized by uh, QWORT in collaboration with Quantum AI Foundation and uh, Go to Gym. Uh, the title is Introduction to Quantum Computing. So basically, uh, it will be really introduction to the theory and uh, some possible applications of quantum computing. Uh, but first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Go to Gym and Juan for uh, helping organizing this this webinar. And second of all, is that uh, um, this webinar will take about one hour, and uh, you will have opportunity to ask. Uh, uh, questions at the end, but if you have any questions during the lecture, you can also um, uh, just paste your questions uh, on uh, on the chat, and I can also try to answer during the lecture or just just after after the lecture. And the last but not least, uh, this uh, lecture is uh, recorded, uh, and we are planning to uh, just prepare a video after the lecture and uh, publish it on our YouTube channel so that you can also later uh, come back to this uh, recording and um, and watch it once again. All right, uh, so let's start. Uh, today I'll give you introduction to uh, quantum computing theory and uh, applications. Uh, so I will start from explaining the basics of, of quantum computing. So I will give you a bit or a qubit of, of theory regarding database quantum computers and uh, adiabatic quantum computers. Uh, later, I will present some of possible applications of quantum computers, mostly related to uh, those adiabatic quantum computers. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I will tell you about my experience uh, in building quantum computing uh, ecosystems. So also about the QWERT organization and, and the Quantum AI Foundation. Uh, and at the end, uh, hopefully, we'll have some time for uh, asking questions and uh, giving answers. All right, so let's uh, start telling about uh, quantum computing. So what exactly is uh, quantum computing? The simple answer is that uh, it, these are just com computations according to the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, so of course, uh, I will not uh, even try to uh, just explain quantum mechanics in, in, in detail because it's a very difficult topic, uh, but um, I will present some of the basics, at least. Uh, I guess that at least some of you heard about quantum mechanics and maybe some of you heard about the word quantum. So what does quantum actually mean? So according to, to Wikipedia, uh, in physics, a quantum is the minimum amount of any physical entity, physical property involved in an interaction. So the fundamental notion that a physical property quant can be quantized is referred to the, as the hypothesis of quantization. This means that the magnitude of the physical property can take on only discrete values consisting of integer multiples of one quantum, right? So we have the smallest portion of some property. Uh, and when we think about computing, so of course we may think about algorithms and mathematics and algorithms and math can be virtual. But uh, when we run computations, we run computations in a physical world. Computation is a physical process, and our world is inherently quantum, so the computing is also quantum. And we know that the world is quantum uh, for more than 100 years. Uh, I think that at least from the Max Planck's postulate, which says that the electromagnetic energy could be emitted only in quantized form. So the energy of a photon or electromagnetic wave is just proportional to the frequency of a photon, electromagnetic wave, and the Planck's constant is just multiplied by, by this frequency. So we cannot have just arbitrary small uh, energy. So energy is quantized and therefore many other um, physical um, properties are also quantized. There's also famous Landauer principle from 1961, which says that there is a minimum possible amount of energy required to analogically irreversible manipulation of information. And it's proportional to the temperature of the environment, and there is also a Boltzmann's constant uh, involved in this proportionality. So we see that, okay, we can run computations, but we run computations in a physical world, which is quantum. So uh, also computations uh, are governed by the rules of quantum mechanics at uh, some level, at least. 
And even Richard Feynman uh, realized that uh, there's nothing that he can see in the physical laws that say that the computer elements cannot be made enormously smaller than they are now. And in fact, there may be certain advantages of that. Uh, and I guess that some of you heard about the famous Gordon Moore's law, which says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. And this prediction is proved accurate for several decades and has been used in the semiconductor industry to guide long-term planning. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, even Gordon Moore said that uh, I see Moore's law dying here in the next decade or so. And uh, the Intel company producing uh, processors realized that uh, the pace of advancement has slowed. So now um, this, uh, the number of tra transistors uh, doubles, not once per two years, but once per two and a half year, more or less. Uh, but the, the trend will be still continue thanks to hyperscaling. <coughs> But uh, it cannot continue forever, uh, because if it continues forever, then uh, in 2035, 2040, the size of a single transistor should be of a size of one atom. And in that case, uh, the transistors should be governed again by laws of quantum mechanics, which is a bit different than classical physics, classical mechanics, uh, which implies that uh, we cannot just uh, run computations in exactly the same way as we do it nowadays. So something will be different in the future if, uh, if we want to still scale down our, um, our processors and increase density of transistors. Uh, Richard Feynman in 1983 said that, uh, uh, so in fact he, he realized that we can potentially build computers which may be governed by the rules of quantum mechanical laws. And he said that now we can in principle make a computing device in which the numbers are represented by a row of atoms with each atom in either of the two states. That's our input. The Hamiltonian starts Hamiltonianizing the wave function. The ones move around, the zeros move around. Finally, along a particular bunch of atoms, ones and zeros occur that represent the answer. Nothing could be made smaller, nothing could be more elegant. No losses, no uncertainties, no averaging. But can we do it? So uh, since we talk about quantum computing, then uh, you might expect that uh, probably the answer is yes. And here you can even see just an example of a quantum processor, which is the brittle, brittle, uh, brittle cone developed by, by Google. Uh, and uh, indeed, there are already uh, several such processors and several different concepts how to build quantum computing processors. <clears throat> and now we will learn uh, how the computations run on such quantum processors will be different from uh, classical computing. So as you probably know, in classical computers, we have bits and classical gates, right? So basically we can uh, just uh, implement any uh, computations using just uh, basic um, logical gates such as AND or NOT. So I'm sure that you, you heard about such uh, classical logic gates. Uh, similar in quantum computers, we have qubits and quantum gates. So what's the difference? Um, a single bit may have a state uh, which uh, may just take, take one of two possible values, zero or one. This is relatively simple. So mathematically, it's just an element from a set zero, one. In case of uh, qubits and quantum computers, the state may be in a superposition of state zero and one. So it's something in between zero and zero and one. So it can be zero and one at the same time. Uh, so mathematically, it's something much more complicated because we can say that it's a unitary vector of the two dimensional Hilbert space over complex numbers. Uh, so I guess that probably not, uh, not everyone heard about Hilbert space and uh, com maybe even about complex numbers. So I will just try to explain some basics and to give you good intuitions. But just one more difference between classical computers, between bits and qubits. In case of bits, the state is determined. So we know exactly whether the state is zero or one. And you can change the value from zero to one and vice versa. But in case of quantum computers and qubits, to get values zero or, or one, we can do a measurement which breaks superposition. So the qubit is no longer 
in a state between zero and one, uh, but it becomes in a state zero or one, depending on the result of measurement. And uh, the result of measurement may not be um, deterministic. So we may just have a probability of getting zero or one, depending on the state of a qubit. And our quantum gates just modify qubits and modify that probability of getting zero and one after the measurement. Uh, so we can think about it as a superposition or just composition of two pure states, zero and one, which mathematically are orthonormal base in a quantum system. So we can just think about it as uh, two vectors which are just perpendicular and uh, their length is, is one. Uh, and those values or parameters A and B are just complex numbers. So I'm not sure if you heard about complex numbers, but uh, if, if not, then you can just think uh, about it as um, intuitively that uh, we have some numbers uh, whose amplitudes or squares of amplitudes should uh, sum up to one. Uh, so, um, and they correspond to probabilities of getting zero and one in a measurement. Uh, and uh, in a complex number theory, uh, or from the complex number theory, we know that when we multiply uh, such superposition by a unitary vector, we don't change the quantum states. So those parameters A and B can be transferred to spherical coordinates. And uh, when you look at the bottom of this slide, you can see the representation of exactly the same quantum state. Uh, it's also superposition of uh, vectors of pure state zero and one, but uh, it's as, uh, those parameters are now described as uh, uh, some uh, angles and trigonometric functions, which might seem to be a bit more complex, but you can think about it as points uh, on a sphere, which is called a block sphere. So in this block sphere, you ha we have uh, those pure state zero and one uh, in our polars. So they are just antipodes. And uh, the quantum state may be just any, um, any point on this sphere, right? So in case of bits, we have just zero or one, so only two possible states. In case of qubits, our state might be just a point on such a block sphere. Uh, and, uh, and some people say that quantum computing is just a journey on a block sphere. sphere. Because I said that when we have quantum gates, then those quantum gates just change uh, one quantum state to another quantum state. So they just uh, change one point on this sphere to another point on this sphere, right? So uh, in case of single qubit, we just uh, uh, travel on this sphere and th that, that, that is how, we, how the computations are, are run basically. So at least this is, this is how we can think about it. Uh, but uh, of course we have some special, uh, special gates um, similarly as in case of classical computers, right? Remember that we had uh, logical gates such as AND or NOT. Uh, here we also have some notable examples of quantum gates. For example, there is a Hadamard gate, which uh, transforms pure state zero and one to superposition of states zero and one, so that the probability of getting zero and one is uh, just uh, half, uh, one over two. Uh, we have an x Pauli gate, which is just uh, which just inverse uh, inverse states of uh, our our qubit. So zero becomes one, one becomes zero, uh, and uh, yeah, there are also Pauli y and Pauli z gates, which are uh, which correspond to some special operations on this uh, block block sphere. Usually uh, these are just uh, um, so we we, we just uh, rotate or uh, introduce a sim symmetry. Uh, there is also one two qubit gate, which is called CNOT, and it's a very important example, uh, because in case of CNOT gate, we just uh, introduce an entanglement between uh, two qubits. So one qubit can be controlled uh, by another qubit. Uh, so depending on uh, the value of a given qubit, so for example, if one qubit is, is one, then uh, we apply not operation on the second qubit. And if the, it is zero, then we don't apply this not operation. Uh, and it's important to note that any quantum circuit can be simulated to an arbitrary degree of accuracy 
using a combination of uh, synod gates and single qubit rotations. So that, that's, uh, that was just an example of uh, applying quantum gates to one or two uh, qubits, but the true power of quantum computing comes from running such computations on large number of qubits, right? Uh, because when you have n qubits, then we can prepare a super so-called superposition of all possible two to the power of n numbers, which can be represented on n bits, right? So when we have n bits, then we have two to the power of n uh, possible numbers, which can be represented on uh, n bits. And uh, when we run computations, then we and then at the end, after the measurement, we can obtain one of those possible two to the power of n numbers. And again, the probability of obtaining every number or the probabilities should uh, sum up to, uh, to one, right? So, and uh, again, here in this example, in this qu simple quantum circuit, we just apply the Hadamard gate to every uh, single qubit, in which is just uh, the input to our computations, uh, so that we obtain uh, the superposition of states, pure states zero and one. Uh, so this is according to um, description of this Hadamard gate. Uh, and we can apply some other uh, operators, some other quantum gates. They are applied to all those uh, two to the power of n states at the same time. And after that, we can just do a measurement. Uh, and the idea is that some, uh, when we apply those uh, quantum gates, then in case of some uh, quantum states, um, the probability may just uh, decrease to zero or almost zero. In some cases, it may be closer to one, so that eventually some uh, obtaining some states is more uh, probable at the end than obtaining some other states. So that's that's the idea. And this is this is an, another example, relatively simple example of a quantum circuit. But this is an example in which uh, I try to uh, represent or encode my initials, so the letters P and G represented as uh, ASCII code, so on eight bits. So here we had as an input eight qubits. Uh, their initial state uh, was uh, zero. Uh, so in case of qubit seven, uh, which is just uh, the last qubit, uh, just looking from, from the right, uh, the input was zero and it's always zero. In case of uh, qubit six, in, the input was zero after applying X gate, um, uh, it, it became one. So we have we have one. In case of qubits three and five, we don't apply any quantum gate, so the state is al always uh, zero. Uh, the qubit four is interesting because we first apply the Hadamard gate, which in, in which means that we introduce a superposition of state zero and one. And now, we, if we have uh, value zero here, uh, then we don't apply the not uh, not gate. We don't apply negation to the qubit zero, but if we have one, then we apply negation. So then we'll have one here, uh, but one will become zero again after uh, just uh, running computations using this X gate once again. So that's why uh, here the qubit four might be at the end zero or one with probability just one over two. And uh, the value of this qubit also, um, uh, determines what should be the value of the measurement on qubits 0, 1, and 2. That's why only those uh, two um, states or two results, two outputs, are possible after the measurements, and both may, uh, may appear with probability 1 over 2. And, and that's why we may um, get such an uh, ASCII code representation uh, of two letters. So you can try to uh, run a similar experiment using, using Qiskit. Uh, framework because that, that was developed in Qiskit. I will be later talking about Qiskit um, uh, as well. It's a, it's a framework for um, just programming uh, such quantum circuits uh, in a graphical way or also by, by just uh, programming your gates. All right, so why, why it is important? In case of classical computers, uh, I said that on n bits, we can process only one of two to the power of n possible n bit numbers at the same time. In case of quantum computers, we can process all to the two to the power of n n bit numbers, which uh, gives us advantage, right? We can see that 
we are able to process um, here two possible values of the qubit four, and that's why we, uh, when we do a measurement, the result is not not deterministic, and we can we can get also one of two possible results at the end. So we see that those computations are a bit different, and also we see that those computations are uh, inherently uh, stochastic. So in case of classical computers, results are deterministic and randomness is in fact a, a pseudo randomness. But in case of quantum computers, we may have real randomness and we can easily sample from probability distributions, which are difficult for classical computers. So that's another advantage of, of quantum computers. And it may, uh, it may have really interesting applications uh, because, um, for example, in uh, nowadays, uh, there are algorithms for breaking some classical cryptography algorithms. So I will just uh, uh, present you <coughs> a short algorithm in a moment. Um, quantum algorithms might be applied in, for solving combinatorial optimization problems which frequently occur in uh, artificial intelligence, for example, in finance, in transport logistics. Uh, also, uh, thanks to this uh, a true randomness we can sample from these difficult distributions. For example, uh, there's quite interesting and difficult for classical computers distribution, which is called Boltzmann distribution, and it finds applications in machine learning as well. We can also simulate quantum processes, which are also random, which may also help us discover new materials, new drugs. So there might be some interesting applications. Uh, later, I will tell how far we are from from that applications. But uh, let's. Uh, a little bit more about one of those possible applications, uh, which is a uh, factorization problem. And it's, it's a very important pro problem because uh, we know that multiplying two n digit numbers uh, is relatively simple for classical computers. Uh, we, can, we can do that uh, in n log n uh, asymptotic time. So we can do that relatively fast on classical computers. But when we want to factor n digit number, uh, into prime numbers, then it's much more difficult because uh, no algorithm has been published that can factor all integers in polynomial time, uh, so with asymptotic time n uh, to the power of, of k, where n is just the length of, or the number of digits in this number, which, which implies that uh, in general, it's a difficult problem for classical computers. Right, so the best uh, best published asymptotic time is based on general number field C, and uh, it's ex exponential time. It's an exponential function of the number of digits, so it's not polynomial. So we know that uh, exponential functions can grow faster uh, with a growing number n than uh, polynomials. However, neither the existence or non-existence of such polynomial algorithms has been proved but it's generally suspected that they do not exist and hence that the problem is not in class P, which is a class of problems which can be solved in polynomial time on classical algorithms. And based on this, that assumptions, uh, uh, researchers built many um, cryptographic algorithms which are applied nowadays in cryptography. So many of such algorithms are based on the assumption that we can easily uh, multiply two numbers but it's difficult to factor one uh, number into just prime numbers. So that's, that's the assumption. So the difficulty of solving this problem is an assumption of many cryptographic algorithms. But in case of quantum computers, we can do that in polynomial time again. So as you can see, the time is uh, proportional or, we, or uh, is asympt asymptotic time. Uh, pessimistic time is uh, n squared times logarithm n log log n. Uh, and uh, this Shor's factorization algorithm is in fact a hybrid algorithm, uh, which means that uh, some part uh, can be run on classical computers, but there is a quantum subroutine which is responsible for finding a period of a long sequence using the inverse quantum Fourier transform. So that, that's also a very interesting algorithm, but uh, yeah, we can just spend the whole lecture on just explaining how the Shor algorithm works. So let's, let's go further to some another uh, applications of quantum computers. Another interesting area is uh, in solving combinatorial optimization problems. Uh, so in such class of problems, we search for the best of many possible combinations. 
So uh, we can think about scheduling challenges such as uh, should I ship this package on this truck or the next one? Or what's the most efficient route a traveling salesperson should take to visit different cities? Um, so it turns out that physics can help solve these sort of problems because th those problems are uh, usually very difficult for classical computers. But in case of quantum computers, we can frame such problems as an energy minimization problems. And if we can do that, then there is a fundamental rule of physics which says that everything tends to seek a minimum energy state. So perhaps if we can, uh, so the objects like downhills, how things cool down over time, right? Uh, and uh, this behavior is also true in the world of quantum physics. Uh, so if we can somehow encode our optimization problem to the problem of seeking an, the state of a minimum energy, then perhaps we can just run computations on quantum computers and the nature will just uh, help us find the optimal answer um, just be because of uh, the rule of physics, right? That everything tends to seek a minimum energy state. Uh, all right, so how we can, how we can do that? Um, we can do that on a special class of quantum computers, which are called adiabatic quantum computers. So an adiabatic process is a process that does not involve the transfer of, or heat, of heat or matter into or out of a thermodynamic system. And in an adiabatic process, the energy is transferred to the surroundings only as work. Uh, and in case of adiabatic quantum computers, the general idea is that first uh, we, have, uh, we have to encode our problem uh, to Hamiltonian. Uh, I will tell later what's ha what is Hamiltonian. So basically it's just uh, a function which for a given quantum state returns the energy of the state. Uh, so we, we should uh, somehow encode our problem to Hamiltonian whose ground state describes the solution to the problem of interest. So that uh, this optimum which we are looking for is just uh, also an optimum of the corresponding Hamiltonian. The next a system where simple Hamiltonian is prepared and is initialized to the ground state. And finally, the simple Hamiltonian is adiabatically evolved to the desired complicated Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, if we do it uh, um, sufficiently uh, slow, then the system remains in the ground state. So at the end, the state of the system describes the solution of the problem, right? And the interesting thing is that it was proven that the adiabatic quantum computing is polynomially equivalent to conventional quantum computing uh, in the circuit model. So based on those quantum gates, which I, which I presented. Uh, so yeah, we can just, uh, in polynomial time, we can just transform one quantum system to another. Uh, so what is Hamiltonian? A classical Hamiltonian is a mathematical description of some physical system. So as I said, we can input any particular state of the quantum system and the Hamiltonian returns the energy for that state. And for most non-convex Hamiltonian, finding the minimum energy state is an anti-hard problem that classical computers cannot solve efficiently, right? So now the idea is that uh, we just prepare a so-called uh, icing uh, Hamiltonian, which is composed of an initial Hamiltonian, which is uh, relatively simple. So the lowest energy states uh, is when all qubits are in a superposition of state zero and one. So we can do that by applying this Hadamard gate. And we should also have the final Hamiltonian, which uh, should correspond to our optimization problem. So that um, the ground state of this quantum system will correspond to the minimum of the optimization problem that we are looking for. And here we also have two functions, which are just functions of a parameter S, which is just a strength of a magnetic field. And now the idea is that uh, by modifying the strength of a magnetic field, we can just uh, move from uh, the initial state to this final state. And if we do it slow enough, then um, the quantum state uh, should always uh, stay um, in a, global optimum. So that's, that's the idea behind adiabatic computations. So in the real world, uh, it's uh, more difficult to, or it's difficult to implement it 
uh, so that not always uh, we can end up in a global uh, optimum. But anyway, in some cases, it might be very useful. Uh, so here I, I told about uh, this uh, Ising model or Ising Hamiltonian. Uh, so Ising model is a model of ferromagnetism uh, in which uh, um, uh, we have uh, um, we have uh, our um, some spins or magnetic dipole moments, which can be represented as plus or minus one values, and uh, there might be some relationships between the spins, which are represented by couplings, uh, and they are just correlations or anti-correlations between between uh, those spins. And uh, then we did the Hamiltonian or the function expressing the energy of the system can be described as, as follows, right? So this is just uh, some combination of uh, values uh, S i, S j, which are just spin up or spin down. So plus or minus one, basically. And we have also some parameters. And now uh, the idea is that we should just uh, encode our optimization problem as a problem of uh, minimizing such a uh, Hamiltonian of a corresponding Ising model, right? And then uh, when we have such Hamiltonian and we have also this initial relatively simple Hamiltonian with all uh, qubits in a superposition, then just by changing the S, which is just the strength of a magnetic field slow enough, the final state will be the solution of our problem. And it can be still, or we want it to be still, uh, the global minimum of the ground state uh, of the of the solution. Uh, so that's the idea. And here, just uh, some interesting description from the website of D-Wave, D -Wave Company, which is a company working on such adiabatic quantum computers. Uh, and uh, yeah, so to begin, there is just one valley with a single minimum, and then the quantum annealing process runs. The barrier is raised, and this turns the energy diagram into what is known as a double well potential. So here on the figure B, we have this double well potential. And here the low point of the left valley corresponds to the state zero and the low point on the right valley corresponds to the state one. The qubit ends up in one of these valleys at the end of the anneal. Uh, yes, yeah, so we can, however, control the probability of it falling into zero or, or the one state by applying, and this, uh, uh, applying an, an external magnetic field uh, to the qubit. Right, and this field fills the double well potential, increasing the probability of the qubit ending up in the lower level. Right, so that's why you may modify those probabilities of uh, obtaining zero and one at the end. And <clears throat> uh, also the, the reason why uh, the quantum state may uh, stay in the ground state is the phenomenon called quantum tunneling. So when we modify the strength of, of the magnetic field, we in fact modify uh, the, our Hamiltonian, we modify the function, so we also modify in its landscape. And uh, if we assume that uh, the, the quantum state of the system is in the ground state, uh, the state of the global minimum for all the time, then thanks to this quantum tunneling uh, phenomenon, our system may just jump over hill and then uh, end up in a ground state again. So that's that's basically the, the idea of um, of quantum quantum tunneling. Um, all right. So now, how to represent our problems as uh, such Hamiltonians, right? Uh, there is a mathematical formulation called Cubo, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, and such problems are traditionally used in computer science. Uh, we also have a set of variables x, which may be a binary variable. So this time they may have values one and zero. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we may have an upper diagonal matrix which just uh, describes our function, right? So now, now uh, we can try to represent our problem as a problem of finding a minimum or the vector x for which um, this function will have a minimum value, basically. So that's, that, that's the idea. Right, so this cube also, we have quadratic because those values x uh, might have uh, the power of two at most, and it's a binary optimization because we have only binary values here, right? Uh, and now everything, uh, or yes, uh, so everything just uh, depends on whether we can translate our optimization problem to 
such cubo formulation, which as you can see, is very similar to the Ising model in the ferromagnetism. So that's why we can later translate this cubo formulation uh, into a quantum state, into our quantum uh, system, which will evolve according to laws of quantum mechanics. So that's the idea. And uh, I will um, present you how to do that based on interesting example. Um, three years ago, Volkswagen um, uh, conducted an interesting experiment together with researchers from the D-Wave uh, company. The goal was to optimize the routes of fleets of taxis in Beijing. Uh, here is a link to the paper titled Traffic Flow Optimization using a quantum annular. And that, that's very, very nice uh, example, uh, relatively simple. So initially, this, uh, this, this scientists built a road network uh, based on OpenStreetMap data, and they had uh, routes from real GPS data. There is a data set called T-Drive. It's a data set coming from taxis in Beijing. Uh, so these were taxis traveling from, um, they selected taxis traveling from the city center to the airport. And if, uh, so for each car, they had just a single route. But later, they also added two other possible routes between the source and destination. So every car had three possible routes, right? The one selected in the real world and two other alternatives. Uh, they also assumed that the travel time is proportional to the function, which is a square of a number of cars on a route, which is a simplification, but it's quite uh, reasonable. And now we want to minimize the total travel time of all cars in such a road network. So we introduce uh, some variables. So let uh, Q i j, which is a binary, uh, will be a binary variable um, indicating whether the car i takes root uh, j. So we know that every car uh, should take uh, exactly one of those three possible routes. And uh, so, so that's why we can ensure that by uh, giving this condition, right? So we have a sum of values of those three variables, minus one, uh, if we just raise it to the power of two, it should be equal to zero, right? Which means, which indicates that exactly one from these three variables should be equal to one, so that every car just takes exactly one root, right? So this is our first condition. And also, let B as be a set of those variables, which are associated with routes that share street segment S. So let's just take all cars and all routes which just share a given road segment S. And now the cost of, they assume that the cost of traveling uh, through this road segment is proportional to the square of the number of cars uh, traveling through this road segment, right? So as I said, it's a simplification, but it's quite reasonable. And now we introduce a cost function, an objective function. Uh, so we want to minimize the total cost, which is the total uh, time of travel uh, from a source to a uh, destination. So we take a sum of costs over all road segments, right? But we also need to ensure that every route in the best solution will be selected by exactly, or that every, every car will select, uh, or we have assigned exactly one route, right? So we also add this constraint, additional component, and we set the value of the lambda, lambda parameter large enough so that uh, in every uh, optimal solution, uh, this uh, component should be equal to zero, so that this condition will be um, will be satisfied by every car for every every i, right? And then we then we can just read uh, read what was the cost, and thanks to that we are able to find uh, the minimum cost uh, for which. This condition is satisfied for every every car, every taxi. Okay, and uh, we can see that we we can just uh, translate it to this cubo formulation. And uh, the scientists run experiments on D-Wave machine, and the results were very good. So they had 418 cars, uh, three times more logical variables. So you can see that the number of possible solutions, possible settings of routes is astronomical. 
but uh, in only 22 seconds they were able to find uh, the setting assignment of roots which was relatively good so here uh, on this figure uh, the color indicates the density of cars so the number of cars uh, passing given road segment so the red or more orange color indicates that there were num that the number of cars and also the, the uh, was greater and the travel time was also uh, higher than uh, than in 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 the in the solution fight by, by this D-Wave machine, right? So it, it looks that uh, they were able to obtain some quite good results, which were in interesting. Similar approaches can be used for improving logistics, for example. So maybe you heard about so-called traveling salesman problem or similar and hard problems in logistics, such as vehicle routing problem or pickup and delivery. And uh, there are already logistic companies which are interested in such solu in such solutions, right? So they want to find the optimal order of visiting um, different uh, customers, for example, right? In order to minimize uh, the travel time. So in a large scale, it's it's really important. It's really important. And if uh, the, this problem is anti-hard, so we cannot solve it optimally on a classical uh, computer. And there might be also applications of quantum computers in uh, machine learning. So I already heard about approaches to build quantum neural networks, um, to uh, build quantum uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, quantum reinforcement learning. Um, yeah, so there are, there are many different approaches. Uh, you can watch very nice video presented by scientists from Microsoft Research, where they also um, explain what might be the pot potential applications of quantum computing in, in machine learning. I think that it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, there are also some uh, theoretical hypotheses that quantum mechanics may be potentially responsible, not only for artificial, but also real intelligence or maybe even consciousness. Uh, so there are such uh, research uh, hypotheses which uh, haven't been proved yet, but uh, who knows, we still don't know uh, everything about uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, all right, so uh, I told you in the beginning that uh, the idea of quantum computing originated more or less in 1980s, and Richard Feynman is considered to be one of the fathers of, of quantum computing. Uh, but uh, what's the reason behind the recent progress and uh, raising in interest, rising interest of uh, quantum computing nowadays? Um, so in the last years, we can observe progress in building a bit uh, larger quantum computers with more qubits than before. So I remember that about 10 years ago, the state of the, state of the art was uh, to build maybe quantum computer with just a um, few qubits or maybe, uh, maybe 10 or less than, less than 20 for sure. But in recent years, we heard about uh, uh, IBM's quantum computer with 50 qubits, uh, with Google's, about Google's quantum computer with 72 qubits. Last year, we heard the Google's announcement about uh, achieving quantum supremacy. I told you about this D-Wave quantum adiabatic computer, quantum annular, uh, which already has uh, 2,048 qubits, and uh, it's expected um, that D-Wave will announce in this year uh, the release of its new quantum processor, which is called Pegasus, and it will have more than 5,000 qubits, and also totally new topology of connections, which may also give some new possibilities, right? And um, also because of that, some companies and research institutes uh, released and developed and released uh, some um, programming frameworks, platforms for programming uh, quantum processors. Uh, such as Forest from Rigatti Company, Strawberry Fields, Penelate, D-Waves, uh, Leap Framework. Um, there is a quantum computing simulator uh, developed by Microsoft, right? And there are also programming languages such as Q-Sharp, for example. So what's, what's might be the future of quantum computing? <laughs> There's a famous quotation that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Uh, so <laughs> we, we cannot be sure, but we may also potentially have some impact on that, and uh, we live. We are living now in very interesting uh, times, uh, but we should be also aware that there are still many obstacles on the road toward real quantum supremacy. 
there are some still open challenges. For example, the coherence, right? It's difficult to isolate qubits from the environment. If, if we only we have some interaction between qubits and in the environment, then our the, the superposition of uh, states may just uh, collapse and uh, we cannot just run quantum computations anymore. So this uh, isolation of qubits is very important. Uh, also, in many cases, it's difficult to prove that quantum algorithms will be better than the classical algorithms. So I told you about the Shor's algorithm, which is a polynomial algorithm for factorizing large numbers. Uh, but uh, it hasn't been proven that uh, we cannot do that in case of uh, classical computers. So we believe that we cannot do that easily in case of, quantum, uh, in case of classical computers. But uh, th there was a similar case called uh, recommendation problem uh, in which uh, uh, Scott Aronson, very famous professor working on uh, quantum computing algorithms, gave an open problem to one of his uh, gifted students to just prove that the recommendation problem, which can be solved in polynomial time uh, on quantum computer, uh, cannot be solved in polynomial time uh, on classical computers. But uh, this student, after some time, uh, found a classical algorithm, which was also polynomial. And this algorithm was based uh, or was inspired by the quantum algorithm, right? So he, he proved something totally different. So it's really not, not easy, not trivial to, to prove that uh, we can really uh, run some useful uh, algorithms uh, on quantum computers faster or better than on classical computers. Also, building some quantum gates is still challenging, right? Uh, because of this decoherence. There is also the problem with error correction. Uh, so I told you about qubits, but uh, we may have physical qubits and uh, logical qubits. So, and because of noise, we may also have to introduce some error corrections. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the, this example uh, about difficulties in proving that quantum algorithms might be better than classical. Uh, so this, this uh, talented student is called uh, Evin Tang. He was a student of Professor Scott Aronson. Uh, that's the case of quantum error correction. So instead of just having uh, or representing one logical qubit on one physical qubit, we may want to introduce uh, another representation in which one logical qubit is represented on three uh, physical qubits. So that uh, if we assume that we may have at most one um, error during a measurement or computations, so one qubit suffers a bit flip, then um, we can easily um, easily fix this error, right? So even if, if, if we observe the error then and we know that there was just only one error among those three qubits, then we know what should be the true, uh, the true value, the true result of measurement, right? Uh, and also uh, with the quantum error correction codes, we have uh, also one, another interesting observation, uh, also uh, credited Peter Shore. Um, uh, oh, in fact, to other computer scientists, Dorit Akaranov and Mikhail ben Orr, uh, who proved that uh, the quantum error correction codes could theoretically push error rates close to zero. And uh, this was a central discovery in the 90s that convinced people that scalable quantum computing should be possible at all. And that this is merely a staggering problem of engineering, right? So we, we know in theory how to do that, but unfortunately it's very difficult to do it in reality. Uh, so that's why there are also approaches to somehow deal with, with the noise and with in, imperfect quantum computers. And there are approaches such as a MISQ, noisy intermediate scale quantum circuit. And there is a Python framework for um, developing uh, such circuits, which, is, which was released by Google. It's called CRQ. Uh, and uh, yeah, also, uh, uh, this noise and, and randomness uh, was uh, partially related to um, to the demonstration of quantum recent demonstration of quantum supremacy, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, Google researchers, uh, even in a paper published in 2018, claimed that something from the output distribution of random quantum circuit as a might be a demonstration of quantum supremacy, and they prove it one year later, in fact. 
right? So that's, that's the paper from October 2019, quantum supremacy using a programmable superconducting processors. And that was also based on the idea of uh, um, sampling from the output distribution of a random quantum circuits, basically. All right, I also thought that there are still difficulties in building quantum computers and quantum gates. Uh, so in case of this quantum annealer, annealer from D-Wave, uh, I said that uh, currently we have more than 2,000 qubits and hopefully this year we have even more than 5,000 qubits. But in case of uh, those circuit or gate-based quantum computers, which are based on ion traps, superconducting qubits or photonic qubits, the number of available qubits is uh, much lower. There are also some interesting ideas such as topological quantum computers, which doesn't exist yet, but uh, if at some time, at some point in time, uh, researchers will develop such quantum computers, then they may also bring uh, some interesting improvements. Uh, here is uh, just an example of a code from several uh, quantum computing li libraries. The first example is Penelain, which was called the TensorFlow of quantum computing because that was probably the first library for developing quantum machine learning algorithms. But later this year, uh, Google released TensorFlow so Quantum, right? So we can, we can also run quantum computing experiments uh, and apply them to machine learning uh, on using TensorFlow library, which is very popular among uh, machine learning specialists. Most of the libraries are based on Python, but there's also an interesting library uh, developed in uh, Julia, which is very interesting programming language. So I also recommend you to read about it because it might be also applied to quantum, especially to quantum machine learning. Uh, Qiskit uh, is a programming quantum uh, programming framework developed uh, by IBM and probably is one of the most popular uh, frameworks nowadays. Another popular framework, PyQ, developed and released by Rigetti company. Project Q, the project uh, under development in ETH Zurich. I told you about, about this quantum annealer developed by D-Wave, so we can also run experiments with quantum annealing and adiabatic quantum computers uh, on using D-Wave's uh, LIB framework. All right, and uh, now at the end, I will tell you a bit about uh, the building quantum computing ecosystem, uh, because, okay, we see that there is very interesting research, there might be interesting applications, uh, so it's important to learn about it. Uh, as much as we can and uh, I, my uh, adventure and uh, yeah I can say that it's adventure in quantum computing uh, began in 2017 when I started co cooperation with a Polish startup board technology and later in 2017 I created a Facebook group quantum AI so I also invite you to join this uh, group there are more than 2015 1,500 members and uh, later in 2018 uh, I started running Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. So we also have a Facebook group to which you can join. Now we have uh, more than 770 members. We started in November 2018 to celebrate 100 years, 100 anniversary of regaining independence by, by Poland and so far we had uh, 17 meetups. Uh, mostly on-site meetup, but recently due to the pandemic crisis, we also have uh, webinars more or less once per month. Uh, so you can uh, check our website where, we, where there is a list of uh, our past events. You can also watch recordings for those meetings on our YouTube channel. We also organized uh, probably the first in Warsaw workshop of programming quantum computers. It was in May 2019. And uh, this is how I met uh, Abuzer Yakarilmas and Maxim Dimitriev from Kulatvia Software. So they were, so this workshop was a part of the Could Drive project. So they were just traveling around Europe and organize, uh, and, and they were organizing workshops on programming quantum computers in different places. And uh, since I met, met them, we started talking about collaboration, and then that's why how Keyword um, uh, emerged. So Keyword is an um, international, supranational in initiative aiming to foster research and collaboration and education in quantum technologies. Um, so I invite you to visit our website, which is Q, you, you can uh, see the link here. And we have several different channels and different projects. Uh, one of the most interesting and important is uh, QQzines. Uh, so QZins are different 
local uh, organizations uh, in, in different countries, which are partners of the Keyword Initiative. Uh, and those cuisines also organize, are responsible for organizing events, workshops in uh, their countries. So currently we have six key cuisines in Latvia, Turkey, Hungary, Balkan, uh, mostly in Bosnia, uh, Poland and in Russia. So if uh, some of you are interested, for example, people from Colombia, then uh, also we can, we can think about uh, creating QQs in, 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 in Colombia and you can, we can also entangle. Uh, we, we aim to expand our scope globally by having more than 50 QQs in by the end of 2023. Uh, three most important keywords, supranational, so we want to engage every country. Diversity, so we want to engage more women and uh, young people, especially juniors. Um, this is the Q board, the board of uh, coordinators of, of Q World. So there are people from, from Latvia, from Turkey, from, from Poland, Hungary, and, uh, and Bosnia currently. Um, Q, Q Workshop, uh, probably the most uh, important initiative. Uh, so as I said, we try to organize workshops uh, in different locations. Uh, mostly in Europe, but uh, of course we are open in, to organize uh, such workshops in um, also outside of Europe as well. Uh, currently, we had more. Uh, we had about thirty workshops. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic crisis, we had to stop organizing such workshops. But maybe we'll try to do that uh, remotely. We will see. There are such plans. Q hackathons. Uh, so far, there were there was just one hackathon in Turkey, it was a few months ago, in December. Uh, Q, Q women, uh, yeah, we are working on involving more women and underrepresented groups. And also we encourage young people, junior, also students from high schools uh, to just uh, get involved in, in quantum computing. Uh, we develop our educational materials uh, and uh, we make them open source and we give open access to those materials. We call this project Q Kitchen. It's a public repository where uh, there are just materials for this basics of quantum computing workshop. And uh, um, there's also Q Pool repository where we develop new materials on, on different topics. Q University. So we aim to just uh, organize some quantum semester in semesters in different different universities to learn uh, quantum computers, quantum computing um courses in, in academia as well uh, q mentor training so sharing experience with individuals and, and groups uh, right so i encourage you once again to visit our website and also join our uh profiles or follow our profiles on facebook uh, twitter we have a public open community slack so you can also join if you are interested we are sponsored by Unitary Fund. Thanks to that, uh, we are able to organize uh, on-site workshops. Uh, maybe just to tell you about QPoland a bit. Right now we have um, 10 members. And uh, yeah, we also organized uh, workshops in Krakow and, and Warsaw to uh, academic cities in, in, in Poland in 2019. So I also invite you to follow, follow our website, our Facebook, uh, group and Facebook and Twitter profiles. And we also have a public Slack community to which you can join and uh, can also stay in, stay in touch and to let you know about, about our new initiatives. Recently, we also established Quantum AI Foundation. So it's a foundation aiming to support research and cooperation in science, mostly in quantum computing and artificial intelligence. So thanks to the, such uh, formal structures, we are also able to receive a funding and sponsorship from, uh, from different uh, uh, partners. And also it's easier to organize uh, workshops thanks to that. I'm currently a founder and chairman of, uh, of the board uh, of this foundation. Uh, in the advisory board, we also have professors of physics um, from Polish uh, universities, institutions. If you want to learn more, of course, I invite you to attend uh, webinars organized by QWORD maybe also workshops, hopefully, after the pandemic crisis. Uh, there are many interesting courses and videos on YouTube, or there is a quantum machine learning course on edX. Um, there is a quantum computing now, Facebook group, quantum AI, Facebook group, uh, 
quantum information, quantum computer scientists of the world unite another interesting Facebook group where also uh, many interesting posts uh, are published. A quantum computing report, weekly newsletter about uh, advancements in quantum computing. There are online tutorials available on websites of Kiski, PyQ, Penelain, and, and other frameworks. And I also invite you to the next webinar of the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. It will be given by Piotr, Piotr Wiskupski from Polish IBM on 11th of May at 6 p.m. So it's uh, the same time as, as today, 11 uh, a.m. in, in Colombia. The title Kiskit Pulse Programming Quantum Computers Through the Cloud with Pulses. And hopefully, so re the registration will start soon. So uh, just follow uh, our group and uh, just stay in touch. And more Q, event, Q, Q webinars will come in the future, hopefully. So now I thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, any questions, then I will be happy to answer. So I will just check uh, whether there are. Uh, some questions on our Zoom. Um, yeah, so there's one question. So it means we have infinite possibilities on block sphere for a qubit to collapse to between zero uh, and one, right? So in theory, yes, but in practice, we mostly uh, deal with. Uh, uh, with some finite number of, uh, so maybe not finite, but there, is, there are only uh, some reasonable uh, states uh, which we can achieve uh, using our uh, quantum, quantum gates, uh, such as this Hadamard gate uh, or, or Pauli gates. Uh, and uh, most of the interesting computations can be, can be done through uh, these gates. So in theory, uh, we can think about uh, such infinite uh, possibilities, uh, but uh, um, in practice, in practice, we usually deal with only finite, uh, finite number of, uh, because also we have just finite number of possible gates and finite number of possible qubits. Uh, but yes, in theory, that might be uh, we may we may work with with in, infinite number of possibilities. Uh, what universities do you recommend for doing PhD in this domain? Um, it's hard to say. I think that uh, the University of Toronto is probably one of the strongest. Uh, and in, in general, uh, Canada is nowadays uh, a hub of quantum computing. So uh, this uh, quantum computing ecosystem is very well developed there. Uh, so University of Toronto, University of Waterloo are just examples. And there are also many startups. Uh, there are some venture capital um, uh, funds which also invest in uh, quantum computing startups. So in general, Canada is a very good place for that. Uh, but uh, I believe that on most of uh, top universities, uh, there are some good uh, quantum computing groups. Um, also, I, I heard about uh, a stronger group, for example, at the University of Bristol at ETH in, in Zurich and to Berkeley, uh, MIT. So there might be many, many different uh, good places. But I, I think that Canada and University of, of Toronto might be one of, one of the best at the moment. Uh, all right, what do you think about application in biology and bioinformatics? Do you know someone who works on that problem, especially in Poland? Uh, so th there might be such applications, of course. So I uh, I, uh, I said that uh, quantum computing might be applied for uh, just simulating some quantum processes and simulating some chemical reactions, for example. And I heard, for example, about applications in protein folding, which is very related to bioinformatics and, and biology. Uh, so. I believe that there, there might be many, many such applications. So even in just designing new drugs or new, new materials, also biological materials. And uh, recently I was also, because I'm also collaborating with one research group in Poland, uh, where we try to predict future mutations of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Uh, and uh, since the process of, mutation is uh, stochastic, it's non-deterministic. Non then at some point we started thinking that uh, 
perhaps quantum computers might be also uh, useful here right uh, and uh, i uh, there is even idea to build a quantum simulator uh, here in poland to just simulate real quantum computers um the question is will you share the video or presentation uh yes yes i'm going to I'm going to share it. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, the video will be publicly available on, on YouTube. Uh, Juan asked, uh, Honey, we recently announced uh, that was going to launch a quantum computer. What uh, difference does this computer have with others? So to be honest, of course, I, I heard about it and that's, that's very interesting because they said that initially the quantum computer will have 64 qubits, but the number of qubits will double uh, every year <laughs> as far as I, as far as I heard uh, so I think that it's uh, it might be uh, controversial uh, because I also heard about such such claims o already several companies said that okay next year we'll develop a quantum co or we'll release quantum computer that will be twice larger twice more powerful and um, uh, in many cases it just didn't happen uh, so uh, it's, it's hard to say uh, wh uh, whether they will do that indeed but to be honest uh, i'm not sure what's uh, what's the difference so for, for sure uh, i heard that it's also quantum or circuit based quantum computer so similar to those quantum computing uh, approaches which i discussed uh, at the beginning of my lecture uh, but uh, and i guess that the difference is probably in just uh, the process of building qubits, building and representing qubits and uh, building and representing quantum gates. But uh, I know, I don't know the, the exact details. So this is just my assumption because they, they just announced that they, they are going to launch it, but they uh, haven't uh, done it yet. So it's, it's hard to say. All right, are there any more questions? As I said, the video will be later available uh, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel of Quantum AI Foundation. Uh, so I will post, um, I will post the information, post the link uh, on a Facebook group of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group, Quantum AI Foundation, Q Poland, Q World. I will also try to send uh, the link to um, to all participants or even to all people who have registered, because not not every. Not everyone um, eventually participated. 